Hello, welcome to Walk in the Park. This is Tony Ingram, your host. And uh, today is November 21st, and this is our 28th episode. This will be our Thanksgiving show, and it'll run for the next week. And um, anyway, the you know, Thanksgiving is normally uh, um, celebrating things that began in New England in the early 17th century, but Today, we're going to go to another part of America in the early 17th century, and that was in, well, first of all, look where we are now. We are in the Finger Lakes in this NASA photograph from space, a Landsat satellite. Can you find us in the middle of the picture there, the, the Finger Lakes? We're the, the two long lakes in the middle, Seneca on the left and Cayuga on the right. And of course, we're at the southern end in, of Cayuga Lake in Ithaca, and now we're going to look at the whole um, Chesapeake Bay watershed and the Finger Lakes. You look up at the top of the picture, there's pointing out the Finger Lakes, but down at the bottom is labeled the Chesapeake Bay, and that's where we're going to go. We're going to go down the, the bottom end of the Chesapeake Bay. We're actually very close to the Chesapeake Bay watershed. If you just go south of Ithaca past Danby, you will be going downhill in Danby Creek's watershed, which eventually flows into the Susquehanna, which flows into the northern end of Chesapeake Bay, one of the largest estuaries in the United States. So uh, down at the southern end of the Chesapeake Bay is a very historic area, which actually slightly predates the Pilgrims and the Plymouth Colony and so forth, and that is the Virginia Peninsula, it's called, and that's where, um, you can see the label there on the upper left, that's where uh, Jamestown, Found, was founded in 1607 in Williamsburg a little bit later, and then some uh, a lot of Revolutionary War history, Civil War history, very historic area. Well, I happen to have occasion to go down there this, uh, well, actually last week, and I was at a conference down in Hampton. You see it says Hampton Roads there. Well, if you look at that, uh, in between those two arrows, you can see sort of a peninsula sticking into the bottom of Chesapeake Bay, and that's called the Virginia Peninsula, as I mentioned. And right at the end of it is the city of Hampton and the city of Newport News. And then when the James River comes around the bottom of that and right into the bottom of Chesapeake Bay. And that whole area at the bottom of Chesapeake Bay is known as Hampton Roads. And we'll get into just why in a little bit. It's called that, or what we think anyway. Uh, but I started out my trip there by going to the ocean. I could maybe title this show Returning to the Sea because it was for me in some ways. And uh, I went down to, uh, initially I flew down more than a week ago to um, Virginia Beach, which is just south of the um, Cape Henry, which is that corner of land just at the bottom end of Hampton Roads there, uh, just south of uh, Chesapeake Bay and Hampton Roads. Cape Henry, by the way, was the first place that the Jamestown colonists uh, landed and uh, where the arrow, pretty much where that arrow is pointing at Virginia Beach. So they have a uh, state park there called First Landing State Park, the most popular state park in um, Virginia. So um, I flew down, I stayed overnight on the beach in a big hotel overlooking the water, and uh, the next morning I was greeted with this beautiful sunrise over the Atlantic Ocean. And this was the view from my balcony from my hotel. And this time of year you get some pretty good deals on the hotels around there and some of the older ones I actually paid sixty dollars a night for this one uh, I came back later and paid a little bit more for a little bit nicer place but um, uh, let's see well we're gonna take a little um, little video interlude here we'll go look at uh, the beach here I'll give you a little bit of uh, uh, let's see bring that up in a second here
excuse me there. Um, so I went for a little walk on the beach, and here you can see the view of the hotels. It's come uh, like a sort of a classic uh, uh, beachfront resort hotel zone with uh, lots of big, tall hotels along it, and it's expanded and expanded. And, and, uh, and you know, that's kind of maybe ugly, but the, ho the views from the hotels are great, and uh, it's nice access to it. But uh, I just went for a little walk on the beach, and I took a few pictures. What I saw, the tide had gone out and left some pools. And look at this interesting texture in the sand. I like that picture. And there's a big, long pier there that uh, uh, I couldn't go out on, but it was fun to walk around. And I got a nice picture there. So, um, okay, let's see. You're gonna... All right, so now we're going to go back to go back to Hampton and uh, back to Hampton Roads. And so the next day I went over and actually uh, went into the city of Hampton. And Hampton Roads is, uh, well, the whole area was settled, uh, was first found, I guess, by this guy. His name is Christopher New Newport. Now there's a city there called Newport News. We'll talk about that later. But um, Newport was a, uh, he was the um, captain of the Jamestown expedition. So in 1607, first he landed at Cape Henry out there north of Virginia Beach, and then he landed over at uh, what's now uh, the city of Hampton, and um, uh, then he went on to Jamestown. They went on to Jamestown and founded the Jamestown colony. And uh, right there in Hampton, or actually it might even be into the city of Newport News at this point, looking out onto Hampton Roads is this little park which is called Monitor Merrimack uh, Park in our, or Overlook. And there's a couple of uh, what we call interpretive signs there that are kind of interesting. This one is uh, about uh, Hampton Roads itself. And I will uh, read you a little bit about Hampton Roads, if I can find it here. Maybe I've got a better picture here to do that with. Yeah, OK. In December 1606, three ships carrying men and boys left England on a mission sponsored by, I'll get back up at another picture, sponsored by a proprietary company headed by Captain Christopher Newport. They sailed across the Atlantic Ocean to North America after a long voyage that first landed at the entrance to the Chesapeake Bay on the south shore at a place they named Cape Henry, which I, I mentioned before. During the first few days of exploration, they identified the site of Old Point Comfort, which they call Point Comfort, is a strategic defensive location, and and a body of water, the entrance to the body of water that became known as Hampton Roads. This is formed by the confluence of the Elizabeth, Nansamont, and James Rivers. So um, three rivers come together there. And do do do. So there's also some uh, another sign there on uh, to the right about uh, Hampton Roads itself and pictures of a pirate because back in those days uh, Blackbeard the pirate and other pirates found it uh, profitable to raid colonial ships carrying all kinds of goods and of, of many nations. So this is a depiction of Blackbeard the pirate and uh, another. This is um, what's his name? This is a British. Officer in the British Navy, Robert Maynard, slaying Blackbeard. And then his head was mounted upon the uh, bowsprit of the ship. So, uh, but the other big thing that uh, this place is noted for is the battle between the first ships, warships that were covered with iron rather than wood called ironclads during the American Civil War. And uh, the South had an ironclad called the Merrimack that could go around and sink and ram and so forth um, Union ships with impunity. And another ship that the um, U US forces, the North, built with a revolving cannon turret on the top, confronted it. And they had a, a battle in right here in Hampton Roads. And uh, it was a draw. And uh, they went away, but the the um, the implications of it are far-reaching because this was the first time that um, iron ships were used in war, and after that there was uh, 
uh, I sort of initiated um, iron warships. So um, a lot of history there, a lot of military history, a lot of colonial history, a lot of Native American history, including, okay, now this is where I used to live. This is Cherry Avenue, just a few blocks, two or three blocks from Hampton Roads. I lived there as a little kid. I was born down that area. And uh, from age one to age eight, I lived on Cherry Avenue, just a few, just maybe two or three blocks from, from Hampton Roads. And uh, you notice the, the road sign on the left there is Kickatan Road. Kickatan Road. My world was very small, but I was aware of Kickatan Road. Now, I'll, I'll read you a little bit about Kickatan Road. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I got the wrong one here. Okay, here we go. Kickatan Road. Slightly south, near the entrance to Hampton River, the colonists seized the Native American community of Kickatan under Virginia's governor, Saint Sir Thomas Gates. Colonists established their own small town with a small Anglican church, July 9, 1610. This came to be known as part of Hampton. Hampton claims to be the oldest continuously occupied English settlement in the United States, 1610. Hampton was named for Henry Worth, Worth, Worthesley, third Earl of Southampton, an important leader of the Virginia Company of London, or for whom the Hampton River, Hampton Roads, Southampton County, County, I'm sorry, and Northampton County were also named. So um, that's where it got its name. So it's funny that um, America was first settled by a corporation, the Virginia Company. There's a lot of history about that. So that's kind of interesting. So uh, uh, we'll go back here. And so, so I went down there, and uh, this is going, returning to the sea for myself, returning to my, my old home, my first home, where I first emerged into uh, awareness. This is the, a block away from Kickatan Road on, on uh, Cherry Avenue, and the, the house just right of center. That, well, that's actually right next to my old home. And this is my old house right here. So the upstairs on the right is where my bedroom was. And my parents were in the, the window to the um, left of that. And then the left rear was where my brother lived way back in the early 1950s. And uh, there's another view of the front of the house. Little has changed. Little has changed. It's been kept up. And they put some curbs and so forth in. But otherwise, except some vegetation changes, the, the neighborhood is largely the same. So, um, all right. Kickatan. Well, the Kickatan, let's see. The, I'll read a little bit more about uh, Kickatan. Uh, the Kickatan village where the English explorers received their first welcome, is where the English received their first welcome in 1607. The tribe remained generally friendly to them until the summer of 1609 when President John Smith of Jamestown sent Captain Martin to forcibly take over the island inhabited by the Nansamans across the mouth of the James. I guess that's over by where Norfolk is today. A company of 17 men mutinied from Martin and absconded to Kikatan to buy corn where they were all killed. Martin abandoned the Nansamans island and returned to Jamestown. The colonists then built Fort Algernon on Algernon at Old Point Comfort, and after the, 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 the anyway, they, um, the English seized the natives' land on July 9, 1610, by luring them out of their village with a tambourine player, then attacking them. The surviving Kikatans fled to merge with other Powhatan groups. So that's the early history of some of the um, falling out of relations among, uh, between the English settlers and the um, British colonialists. Well, you go around the corner, and this street goes five blocks. And you get the feeling when you walk around this neighborhood, these small streets, that they really haven't changed much in the last couple or 300 years. They're, they're small, and, they're, they're, and my neighbor hasn't changed in 50 years, uh, and probably much longer than that. And the end of it is this school. With Elementary School, George With Elementary School, and this is where I went until into about halfway through the third grade, whereupon my father got a transfer to New York, and we lived on Long Island for the rest of my childhood. 
But uh, George Wythe was an interesting guy. Let's see. We'll go. Now we're going to, uh, actually, later that day, I went over to Williamsburg, and the next day I uh, spent at Colonial Williamsburg, which you've probably heard of and you may have been to. And this is George Wythe's house. This is a house built in the 1700s. And George Wythe was an interesting fellow. Um, there's a little plaque to him here in front of the house. And uh, let's see, this is his uh, portrait when he was about 80 and the back of the house and his garden. So this house is in very good shape. I mean, it's been kept up, of course, but, but the, uh, the mortar and so forth is very good. So I'm going to read you a little bit about uh, George Wythe, see if I get the, oh, I get the uh, camera right here. Okay. All right. Lived from 1726 to 1806. He was an American lawyer. In fact, he was the first lawyer, I think, in uh, America. A Virginia judge and prominent opponent of slavery. He was the first law professor, in, oh, he's the first law professor in the United States and a noted classical scholar in Virginia. He taught and was a mentor to Thomas Jefferson and other men who became Virginia leaders. The first of the seven Virginia signatories of the United States Declaration of Independence. With served as a representative of Virginia and a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. Opposed to slavery, with freed all his slaves beginning in 1787 after the death of his second wife. As a Virginia justice in the case of Hudgens versus Wright in 1806, he tried to end slavery in Virginia by judicial interpretation and referring to the 1776 Virginia Declaration of Rights as the basis that all men should be considered, quote, presumptively free. His deci decision in favor of freeing a family of American Indian descent was upheld by the Virginia Supreme Court although his reasoning based on the Declaration of Rights applying to all was not. George with, okay, yeah, that's, that's okay, that's pretty much it. Um, so that's kind of cool. He was a, uh, you know, a, a slave-owning, um, plantation-owning, uh, colonial, and then revolutionary elite. Um, he was a more progressive one, obviously. So also at Colonial Williamsburg, there are many other structures and this one is the uh, governor's palace. It was uh, it was destroyed at some point. I mean, it was rebuilt about 80 years ago, I think. There is a um, royal uh, emblem up there on the end of one in the back of the building towards the garden. And I went on a tour. And uh, the staff at the Colonial Williamsburg, of course, uh, uh, they are what they call what you call living historians. They um, they're in costume, and they're also in character of the time. So this woman was saying that the governor, the colonial governor, had just left because of the uh, threat of insurrections in Williamsburg. And uh, um, so it was interesting. Gave us a tour and said we can go around the house because the governor wasn't there. In back is the uh, a big portrait of King George III, and there is his very young wife, Queen Charlotte. So. Um, Colonial Williamsburg is a um, interesting place to visit if you get a chance or if you haven't. They are um, scrupulously uh, study what things were like and the materials and so forth. They have shops and so forth. Here is a um, uh, obviously some transportation from the time, and uh, you can learn about the the farm animals and so forth they had, and they actually used some of the the, uh, the animals and the and the materials from the animals and so forth in trying to be true to the to the time and the technology of the time. And uh, I went over and visited their brickyard, and they were making bricks. You look over just to the, uh, that gentleman's right on the left center of the picture. Over on the left, you can see there is some molds that in the summer they take clay, local clay, which they piled up, and uh, they make adobe bricks out of them. And then they were just about to fire them in this, this big kiln here. And they built fires underneath, and they raised it up a couple of thousand degrees, and eventually all the bricks that turn red with the oxidation of the iron in the clay, and uh, they used those bricks to to restore buildings there. So they use all the old methods. And nearby was this enormous pile of oyster shells, which are um, uh, burned to produce the lime, which becomes used, in, which is used in the mortar for the bricks, and it actually produces a superior mortar to what we do today from what we make from limestone, I guess. So uh, so that's uh, that's kind of fun to go around to see. The, there was a lot of craft shops and so forth. I didn't make it to this time. I've been there a couple times before. But uh, I, I did do a lot of the outdoor stuff. 
And then they have some dramatizations. This was out in front of the La Raleigh Tavern, and uh, this guy was uh, recruiting uh, men for the Continental Army, and he was quite a character. He was a lot of fun. And uh, there was this dramatization of uh, um, a slave uh, pastor from a church who had, was celebrating. He had, the church had just been accepted by um, the uh, white uh, churches in the area in this in this confederation, and uh, it was a woman of the, from the community who was saying, "Why do you want to belong to a white organization?" Essentially, so they deal with uh, slavery and they deal with uh, 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 civil rights and so forth, and things that were going on at the time. And uh, George Washington came out on the porch of the Raleigh Raleigh uh, Tavern and declined his um, declined a third term. That was fun. But uh, here's uh, here's my favorite. This guy here. This is Marquis de Lafayette. We're going to see a little video by him. Let's see. Have him up in a second here. The army of our enemy, Lord Cornwallis, has just surrendered! <laughs> My friend, we have won at Yorktown, and it is more than that. It has been an unconditional surrender, meaning that Lord Cornwallis has been forced to surrender all of his soldiers and all of his flags and all of his equipment. My friends, it is the greatest victory in this war since that of Saratoga! <laughs> on this glorious occasion for all of those brave soldiers who marched into harm's way, who gave their lives at Yorktown, and for all of those soldiers who have fought and died for American freedom, let us applaud them all! Yay! My friends, it is difficult to believe that this great campaign that has now culminated at Yorktown began but a few short months ago when General Washington dispatched me, the Marquis de Lafayette, right here to Virginia. I was given three tasks. First, well, it was to capture a man we all once called a friend. You know of whom I speak, do you not? General Benedict Arnold. I was to bring him to justice. Yes, voice your opinions, my dear friend. My second order was to prevent the enemy from capturing all of the stores, the equipment in this bread basket of North America. And third, when General Washington would give the order. I was the whole of the enemy right here in Virginia and prevent them from moving northwards to support the war around New York or southwards to support the war in the Carolinas. <laughs> well, friends, upon my arrival this past spring, I could not complete the first part of my task. Why? Because General Benedict Arnold had been recalled back to New York by General Clinton, there to take part in a campaign of destruction upon his former neighbors in Connecticut. Well, replacing him, coming up from fresh victories in the South, was none other than Lord Cornwallis. Indeed, the most capable of the English commanders. And we would fight a cat and mouse campaign all summer long, right here in Virginia. Battles such as Point of Fork, Spencer's Ordinary, Green Springs Plantation, until, my friends, two months ago, I received the order that I had hoped for. It was from General Washington. And he stated that he would soon arrive here in the Tidewater. He would begin to mount southwards from the upper part of the state of New York, not to attack New York City as initially planned, but rather to come all the way here in the hope that he could meet Lord Cornwallis in the open field and defeat him in detail, bring about another grand victory and an end to this war. And of course, he would not be alone, for with him would be the grand French army, commanded by Le Comte de Rochambeau, who had arrived here in America July the 10th and the 11th of 1780. Well, friends, these soldiers marched, and they arrived right here in Williamsburg City. And, my friends, by the 28th day of September, we began the march upon Yorktown. But half the battle had already been won, had it not, my friends. For it would be at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay that the French fleet under Admiral de Grasse would defeat the English fleet under Admiral Graves, paving the way for our glorious victory at Yorktown! Yeah. Well, my friends, we would march on Yorktown. We surrounded that place. We dug our entrenchments. We put our guns in place. By the 7th of October, all was prepared. General Washington gave the order to fire, and we began the fierce bombardment. It was more than Lord Cornwallis could handle. 
by the evening of the 14th of October, under cover of darkness, we seized the last two earthen fortifications, known as redoubts number 9 and 10. By the next morning, we were firing point-blank range into the enemy lines. Well, Lord Cornwallis would try in vain to escape this situation, to cross the York River, to cross the point, and thereby break out by land. But friends, proving that God once again is not an Englishman, <laughs> a great storm would rise up and push his boats back, preventing him from escaping. Uh, well, it was but a few short days ago, my friends, that Lord Cornwallis asked to parley, asked to speak for terms of surrender. And that surrender has arrived on this glorious day, my friends, the 19th day of October of the year 1781, a day we shall never forget, for it is the day we won at Yorktown. Okay, that guy was a lot of fun. Um, so that's the kind of thing you can see at um, um, Colonial Williamsburg, a nonprofit organization, is right off the end of William and Mary College in the, the small city of Williamsburg. And uh, I, as I often do as I go to places, uh, uh, parks and so forth, I buy a baseball cap, which I like to wear. So I got one here. I got a couple or th two or three hats on this trip. And um, I'm just going to finish off with just a minute or so from one other little video. This is Martha Washington showing up at the um, uh, Raleigh tavern so we'll have that up in a second here stand up who's just a little bit of that. We're running out of time, so uh, I want to thank you all for joining me today, and I hope you've had a, a happy holiday, happy Thanksgiving, and so forth. And uh, meanwhile, stop looking at these screens and go outside and have some fun. Enjoy our Finger Lakes and wherever you are and uh, in the real world. <laughs>